Chapter 9, Solutions, Section 9.3, Solubility. Solubility in chemistry is a term that really refers to the maximum amount of a solute that can dissolve in a specific solvent. So sometimes we talk uh, more casually about solubility and whether something is soluble if it dissolves or insoluble if it doesn't. Uh, but when we're talking about trying to quantify that, then we're talking about the maximum threshold of solute in a given solvent. Okay? And that number can be quantified and the quantity is called the solubility. Sometimes it's called the maximum solubility or the solubility limit. Okay? This solubility is temperature sensitive. So when you change the temperature of the solvent, it'll change how, man, how much solute it can dissolve. And so it'll change the solubility. Typically, we worry about solubility in water. And often it's expressed as the grams of solute that can dissolve in 100 grams of solvent, usually water. Okay? So solubility equals grams of solute per 100 grams of water. This solubility limit really uh, separates two different types of solutions. Uh, before you get to the limit, you have an unsaturated solution. So if you have less than the maximum amount of solute in a solution, then the solution is unsaturated. It, so it can still dissolve more solute particles. If you were to pour more in, they would dissolve. Okay, so on the left-hand side here, you can see we have an unsaturated solution. All the particles are dissolved, and as you pour in new salt, it's still dissolving. If you have the maximum amount of solute or you try and add more than the maximum, you're going to get what is known as a saturated solution. Okay? So the solubility maximum is just that. It's the maximum you can get to. So once you've reached that level, you can't dissolve any more solute into the solution. If you add more solute into the mixture, into the container, it'll just uh, settle to the bottom like you see here as solid. Okay? So you can see this solid salt at the bottom of this beaker. Uh, because you've exceeded the solubility limit. So whatever is left goes to the bottom, and the liquid on top stays with the same concentration as defined by the solubility limit. Okay? And so you can't dissolve any more solute into this mixture. Okay? What you do have, though, is an equilibrium between particles, solute particles that are in the solution and solute particles that are uh, crystallized in the solid phase at the bottom. Okay? And so you're going to get really an equilibrium where you have solid crystal molecules uh, becoming dissolved aqueous particles, and then you have the reverse as well, dissolved aqueous particles settling back and recrystallizing into the solid state on the bottom. And so this happens in both directions all the time, millions of times a second, um, but they'll be balanced. So once you have a saturated solution, they're in equilibrium where the number of particles uh, leaving the solid phase is the same as the number of particles coming back into the solid phase. So there's no large-scale change observable. So let's identify each of the following situations as saturated or unsaturated. Uh, if we have a solution and we pour salt into it and the salt disappears as you put it into water, then you can be pretty sure that that's an unsaturated solution. Okay. The salt is dissolving because there's still room left for it to dissolve, or it's disappearing because there's still room left for it to dissolve. Uh, for B, if you take sugar and you add it to a cup of water, but the sugar doesn't disappear, it just sits at the bottom of the cup, uh, even after leaving it for a while and stirring it up, it still falls to the bottom. That must be because this is a saturated solution. Okay, so you can't fit any more in, and any new solute you add just settles to the bottom. This example says at 40 degrees Celsius, the solubility of potassium bromide, KBR, is 80 grams per 100 grams of water. Identify the following solutions as either saturated or unsaturated. Now, instead of giving us uh, observations, they're actually telling us quantities, and we need to compare this to the solubility limit. So for each of these combinations, we can take the amount of solute divided by the amount of solvent and compare it to 80 out of 100. Okay, so 60 grams of KBr divided by 100 grams of water equals 0 0.6. Okay, uh, but this solubility limit is 80 grams out of 100 grams, and so 80 grams out of 100 is 0 0.8. Okay, so this one is less than the solubility limit. If it's less than the solubility limit, it must be unsaturated. 
The next one is 200 grams of KBr and 200 grams of water. So 200 grams of KBr divided by 200 grams of water is going to be equal to 1. Okay? And so this is going to be greater than the solubility limit, which means this is a saturated solution. Okay. And then the last one is 25 grams divided by 50 grams. And this is going to equal 0 0.5, which is less than 0 0.8. Okay, and so this is an unsaturated solution. As we saw, the temperature can have an effect on the solubility. So the solubility of most solids, for instance, increases as you heat up the liquid or you heat up the solution. So if you uh, want to dissolve more salt, you can heat up the water and it'll dissolve a little bit more. Now table salt, uh, it doesn't increase very much, very little moderate increase. But a lot of these increase a lot. So glucose, a type of sugar, becomes much more soluble as you increase the temperature. Potassium iodide becomes soluble. Uh, sodium nitrate, potassium nitrate, sodium phosphate, these are all ionic compounds, well, except for the glucose, uh, but these are all ionic compounds and they become much, much more soluble as you increase the temperature. For gases, however, it's the opposite. As you increase the temperature of a solution, any gases dissolved in the solution will tend to uh, be expelled. They'll come out of the solution because you're giving it energy and so those gas particles are gaining more and more energy and that helps them to flee the solution. With the solids, when you gave them more energy, it helped to break the solid down into individual particles that would then dissolve. Okay, so you can see why it has different effects on solids versus gases. So why could a bottle of carbonated drink possibly burst or explode? Now we come to Henry's Law. Henry's law states that the solubility of a gas in a liquid is directly related to the pressure of that gas over the liquid. So if we increase the pressure of a gas on the surface of a liquid, more gas particles will dissolve into the liquid itself. Okay. Uh, this explains why soda starts to become flat once you open it, right? So if you have a sealed carbonated can of soda, it has a bunch of CO2 gas molecules over the surface of the liquid, right? Some of these are dissolved into the liquid in the form of this carbonation, uh, but some of them remain here in the empty space in the top of the can. Once you open the can, those particles are all going to fly out into the atmosphere, okay? And so you're going to be left with very few particles over the liquid left, which means that the uh, CO2 is not going to dissolve as efficiently in the liquid either. So when you reduce the pressure of the gas over the liquid, the CO2 will also start to come out of the liquid and be expelled itself. Okay? So as soon as you open a can of soda like this, it begins to lose CO2 right away. Going back to ionic compounds now, it's important to note that not every ionic compound is soluble in water. Okay? Many of them are, and a lot of the common ones that we use are. So we tend to think of all ionic compounds as being water soluble, but they're not. Uh, in fact, only ionic compounds that contain a certain set of soluble ions will dissolve in water. And so this chart shows us those ions. Okay, So any ions that are showing up in this chart are, are soluble ions in the sense that a compound made from them will be soluble. Okay, So the positive soluble ions are lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and ammonium. And there are no exceptions listed here. So every compound made with these ions in it is a soluble compound. Okay? Same thing for this first row of negative ions. So you have nitrate and acetate and no exceptions listed. So anything formed from nitrate or acetate is going to be an ionic compound. For the second row, you have some exceptions though. So chloride, bromide, and iodide tend to be soluble. So usually ionic compounds formed from chloride, bromide, and iodide are soluble because they're soluble ions. But when they're combined with these three specific exceptions, silver, lead, and mercury, silver, lead, and mercury, uh, those are not soluble. Okay, so silver chloride, silver bromide, silver iodide, those are all insoluble. Lead chloride, lead bromide, lead iodide, mercury chloride, mercury bromide, mercury iodide, those are all insoluble compounds because they have uh, these ions, which are listed as exceptions to the solubility. 
And then for sulfate, it's similar. Sulfates tend to be soluble, except barium sulfate, lead 2 sulfate, calcium sulfate, strontium sulfate, or uh, mercury sulfate. Okay, so those are the insoluble sulfates. Any other sulfate is soluble. Okay. Uh, other than these ions, if anything doesn't contain one of these soluble ions, right, meaning uh, basically this list here, any compound that doesn't contain at least one of those is going to be insoluble. Okay, so that's a large number of compounds. So don't just think every ionic compound is soluble. Uh, depends on the properties of the ions involved. Okay. Here's what it looks like when you take an insoluble ionic compound and you try and put it into water and see what happens. So these don't form uniform homogeneous solutions. They form big clumps of undissolved particles all over the place, right? So that indicates that these are not soluble compounds, this cloudiness and the formations and stuff that you see. And so we can use that table to predict the solubility of compounds based on which ions are in them. Uh, now, this is not something that you need to memorize. You don't have to know that table, um, but you should understand that there are certain ones that are soluble and certain ones that are not. Okay, So it doesn't uh, confuse you if you're presented with one or the other. Uh, but we can go through these pretty quickly. So potassium sulfide has potassium in it. That makes it soluble. Okay. Calcium nitrate has nitrate in it, and so that makes it soluble. Okay. Contains nitrate is your reasoning. Lead chloride is insoluble because chlorides tend to be soluble, but lead is an exception. Okay, so this is an insoluble compound. A sodium hydroxide has sodium that makes it soluble always. Aluminum phosphate, well, this is a confusing one because we didn't see aluminum or phosphate anywhere in that chart. But you have to remember if you don't see an ion in that chart, then it means it's not soluble. So this compound does not contain any soluble ions, and so therefore it is insoluble. Let's do the same thing for these compounds. So you have cadmium sulfide. This doesn't contain any soluble ions, so it is insoluble. Sodium sulfate has sodium, so it's soluble. Lead iodine is one of those uh, Exceptions, right? Iodides tend to be soluble, but lead makes it insoluble. And then the last one, nickel nitrate, that has nitrate, and so that's going to be soluble. Okay, so insoluble, soluble, insoluble, soluble. The fact that some combinations of ions join together to form insoluble ionic compounds actually explains why uh, some precipitation reactions occur, some double replacement reactions. So for instance, this question says, what precipitate forms when solutions of lead nitrate and potassium sulfate are mixed? So both of those compounds form soluble solutions in water. Okay? Lead nitrate has nitrate ions, and so it, it's soluble. And potassium sulfate contains potassium ions, which are always soluble. So both of these uh, completely dissolve into individual ions when you put them into solution. When you mix them together, though, you might get a new combination that doesn't uh, still dissolve in solution, that becomes insoluble. And if that happens, that's going to drive the reaction forward, and that uh, insoluble compound is going to be produced and then come out of solution. If it weren't for that, then all of the ions would still just be jumbled together. Okay? So you have to be forming something in order for the double replacement in solution to really mean anything. So if we have a question like this, the first step is to write down the ions that we get at the beginning. So if we put lead nitrate into solution, initially we're going to get a bunch of lead ions and a bunch of nitrate ions. If we put potassium sulfate into solution, we're going to get a bunch of potassium and a bunch of sulfate ions. Okay? These are all soluble compounds. Lead nitrate has nitrate, which is always soluble, and potassium sulfate has potassium, which is always soluble. But if we have all these ions in solution, they might um, change partners. They might mix up one another, and they may form a compound that is no longer soluble. And that would be formed as a precipitate. It would come out of the solution, and it would drive the reaction forward. So looking at the ion pairs that we have, first, uh, lead and nitrate are connected together, and potassium and sulfate are connected together. Okay? But remember, you always have in an ionic compound a positive and a negative. 
a positive ion is not going to be attracted to another positive ion. So this lead and this potassium are not going to attach to one another. They're going to repel one another if they come close. But the lead, which was originally attached to the nitrate, uh, may also find that it's attracted to the sulfate. Okay, So you might get these cross interactions. Okay, So lead could pair up with sulfate, and potassium could pair up with nitrate. So then the question is, of these two new possible combinations, are any of these soluble, or are they insoluble? So we can put them together and take a look at what we get. Okay? When the lead leaves the nitrate, it's going to find the other negative ion, which would be the sulfate. And so we would get lead sulfate. Okay? Lead sulfate is an insoluble salt from that table. We can see that lead sulfate is insoluble. The other thing that we get is potassium ions joining with nitrate ions, and so we would get potassium nitrate. But because these are both such soluble ions, potassium nitrate itself is very soluble. Now we can start to write the equation for the reaction between lead nitrate and potassium sulfate. And so we start with all of the ions that we have in the reactants. Okay, So lead nitrate is lead 2 plus in the aqueous state, uh, and two nitrates also in the aqueous state. And then potassium sulfate is two potassiums in the aqueous state and one sulfate in the aqueous state. Okay? So these are all of the ions that we start with. But when lead and sulfate combine together, they form an insoluble compound. So if an ion of lead meets up with an ion of sulfate, they're going to tend to stick together and form very strong bonds and then form a solid and, and come out of solution. So these are going to form the insoluble lead sulfate compound that's now listed with a solid phase designation. Okay? So this is the precipitate. The solid that's formed uh, in a double replacement reaction is the precipitate. Okay? And then the other two things, though, are still soluble. So the other two ions are potassium and nitrate. And the positive potassium will be attracted to the negative nitrate. Um, but not very strongly. These are both very soluble ions, so they're going to tend to stay separated in solution. Okay? So the K gets an aqueous and the nitrate gets an aqueous next to it. And so then what we're left with is the net ionic equation, which just shows you the formation of the precipitate. You have lead 2 plus plus sulfate gives you lead sulfate. Okay? And this is your answer.